Welcome to the Women's Sports Podcast. I'm bringing you episode seven. My name's Lois Forsell, and today I'm joined by two guests. I'm going to start off with guest number one. I'm joined by Robert Bergen. He is the co-founder of Latin Heat. And then later on in the episode, I'm going to be joined by head coach of the Brazil Women's Rugby League side, Matt Gardner. And we're going to be discussing something that we're all looking forward to, the Women's Rugby League World Cup. But everyone's anticipating and excited for the arrival of new newcomers, Brazil Women's Rugby League. And I was lucky enough to have a little bit of interaction with those last year in December. And on that journey, I was I met Rob. He was our guide for the for the week or so and a brilliant guide at that. And is you know, you're doing an absolutely amazing job, Rob, with everything Brazil rugby league related. So what a time to catch him catch up with you and, and speak to you about what's got what you've got coming up. How are you? Yeah, good. It's good to see you again in very different circumstances to last time. I know it'd be better to be having a caipirinha in, in Sao Paulo again, but we'll uh, we'll, yeah. we'll go virtual, is it? <laughs> Stuck yeah, in my house. How are things in in Australia? Yeah, well, they've they've just relaxed the uh, the conditions a bit in Queensland, so we're allowed to go down the beach and have a picnic and that type of thing, but still limited interaction and only allowed to have a certain number of people in your group and in your home. So uh, we're not out of the out of the woods yet. There's there's still um a few little sp- spot areas where there's outbreaks but uh i think we're doing an okay job and purely because of our isolation it's it's a bit easier for us to handle yeah and what about have you, have you caught up with hugo and the guys in brazil how are they getting on yeah i mean it's it's very hard for them because their restrictions came in later and the uh i guess corona took hold a lot quicker there so we were we were watching it at first from australia and they had pretty much the same number of diagnosed cases as us but the the death rate was like eight times as high as, as what we had in Australia. And, um, yeah, sadly enough, myself and my wife know two people from my wife's hometown under the age of 16 who have passed away. So um, there's just a, you know, it's a different level way of living, different um, different level of awareness as well. So we've we got to bear with that. And we probably won't be expecting Brazil to come back from this in terms of public sport until a couple of months after what Australia does. Yeah, well... Well, wishing everyone back in Brazil um, all the best and hoping that they stay safe and well. Um, a brilliant time when we went out in December, so wishing the best for them. It's a tough time, but um, I'm sure that they'll all be pulling together like like every other nation and, and country. But yeah. so speaking about the Rugby League World Cup, and I thought it'd be a great time to check in because we've had the launch of the mascot and the launch of the name for the women's team ahead of 2021. Um, do you yeah. want to do you want to talk to me a bit about that? How did that come into fruition a little bit when we were in Brazil in December? Yeah, exactly. That all come from that little bit of a strategy meeting, and it just hit me. I um I think that the Amazonas, which is the the Amazonian Warriors, it, it works on a number of levels. Just that that strong group of women who are at the forefront, because really Brazil's women team is not just at the forefront of um, the sport for their country, but in taking Latin America forward, both men and women. They're the first one uh, to get there from from any side. So, uh, you know, they're really at the forefront of, of, you know, the battle to get rugby league up and going over there. Um, we we um, With the logo there, we're trying to make that person look de- as determined as possible. And obviously there's, there's a lot of natural strength, as you saw over there too, so trying to highlight... Um, how well they could be. We'll, we'll probably play around a little bit with that, with some mascots and that. So we might bring in some animals to offset the, the Amazona in the middle as well and just make a bit more for fun for kids too. So um, there's a few things to go with it. Yeah, no, it's good. And I know as soon as it came out, Dave Rotherham sent me an email saying, I don't know if you've seen this off of uh, Rob. And it, it's just bizarre because I guess you must get this feeling all the time. But I think for me and Dave as well, who came over in December with the Rugby League World Cup visit, um, it, you're creating history in every step of the way. So it kind of makes everything feel a little bit more a bit more special and a bit more amplified. And like you say, the women are strong and they are doing it for, for Latin America. They're the first ones to, to qualify and to get through. And do you think, that, do you think that's a... Even do you think that makes it even more of an exciting proposition for the women within Brazil to get involved as opposed to something that's been done before? Oh yeah, absolutely. And and there's a chance for them to become real, really well known within their group over there. So, uh, you know, it's only a, a limited pocket that play union and and league. Um, and for them to be at the front of all their peers uh, in in the sport is amazing. And who knows what opportunities could come down the track 
we saw Marguerite go from Maringá, which is the furthest west city that plays rugby league in Brazil, and for her to go to London and meet Prince Harry, like that's it's like a, one of those out of Africa movies or something. You know, it's such an amazing experience for her. Yeah, I mess I messaged her when when she went across and just to say, oh, you have a brilliant time and. You just think about the way that sport is a vehicle to change lives. Like, I know that sounds very cliche, but it 100% is. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gone to Brazil and had an amazing week with, with you guys and learned so much about a culture, about the people, about the sport and how you can build it in, in, in different parts of the world. And the same with her. She wouldn't have, you know, meeting Prince, you know, meeting Prince Harry, that's something that people in England don't get to do. So someone from Brazil to get to go across and do it is is absolutely amazing. And... I think we'll come back to the Amazonas and the the, the players that we met um, whilst we were in Brazil and, and at the national finals and championships. But to just rewind a little sure. bit, because I don't want to skim the fact of how much of a pivotal role you've had in getting Brazil women to this point, along with you know other people who you'll mention along the way, like Hugo and um, and um, Dave, and Gilberto yeah. and Gilberto, yeah, but. Latin Heat, talk to me about how that came about and how big that how big that has grown for you. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a couple of um, origins to the story. So one of my really good friends at primary school was an Argentinian kid and uh, there was a period they were spending a lot of time around his house and Argentina um, actually happened to win the Football World Cup at that time and so there was just all this like lovely food. His mum was a lovely lady. They were so animated and having a great time and then I enjoyed being around them so much and I thought, oh, why doesn't Argentina play my favourite game, which is rugby league? So um, that was when I was eight years old. I started thinking about why don't South Americans play rugby league? And then um, when I was going through university, I started to um, sponsor some, a Colombian child through his own school over there to help him get through and, and finish up. Uh, and then at, at the end of that, when he kind of finished his high school stint, I decided Whatever I did next, I wanted to to benefit more than one people. I benefit a community, uh, and then I went travelling, went backpacking in in South America three times, and just absolutely loved it. Loved the people, and then when I came home to a reality, I thought um, that I still want to be involved with those people somehow. And I thought, what have I got to offer? And you know, I'd, I'd been involved in rugby league a long time by then, so uh, came up with the idea. You know, went over there, we introduced it to people, and a lot of people think I, I started it because of my wife, who's Brazilian, but I actually met her uh, like after the idea. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and then 90, uh, 2013 is when we played our first game. Uh, and then from that it grew from being a composite team into all the individual nations. So, um, you know, the, Chile's been a very prominent one for the men. Also some teams like Colombia, Uruguay, uh, Peru, Mexico have been there and about, still got a bit to grow. Um, El Salvador, surprisingly strong, and Argentina, of course, as well. So um, from a little core group, it's it's really started, and it started as an Australian heritage thing, but now the bulk of the players are all over in Latin America itself, which was always our intention. So uh, it's really pleasing, and for me, it, I almost feel like a lot of these players are my family now, and I'm, it's such a great feeling to go and catch up with them when I go over there, yeah, it's it is it is amazing, and it's and I'm, I was reading that you know in 2015 it, it just started with you know you had your games in 2013, then 2015 it was all about you know sending jerseys over, and I I saw so many of the tops when I were over there that the guys just all had Latin Heat jerseys on, and that must be a great feeling for you when you go across to see that, um, and, oh, then, yeah. and then the rules and stuff like that, and I know that. Oh, you've got um, Paul involved as well now, Paul Grundy, and he's helping with the coach development side. So there's a small army of you that are really making a difference. And for hopefully people who are, who tune into this won't actually know how much is going on in Latin America because, you know, I didn't know up until being lucky enough to get the visit. But it is a hotbed. And like you say, speaking about how Brazil women got to the World Cup, people will, will be probably questioning, you know, how did they? And, they went on, didn't they? And they had a tough game, but they managed to beat Argentina, who was... And Brazil were probably the underdogs in that game because Argentina played a lot more rugby. Were you at that game or did you manage to, to get feedback from that game? What was that like? Yeah, I had people over there that were giving me feedback. Um, I, that was probably the first event in South America I couldn't travel to, though, unfortunately. Uh, but, yeah, I'd been to the previous games that Argentina had played, the women's side, and they 
beaten Chile twice before and composite side with Colombia as well. And they kept Chile to, to nil, the Argentinians. So I, I wasn't expecting the the size of the score that Brazil won by. And I think one of the positives and things for people to keep in mind is that Argentina is going to bounce back. Like we've got no no delusions that well, they're going to be easy beats. So people are saying, well, who are you going to play in the, the lead up to the World Cup? Um, you can't just stay in Latin America, but if you see the standard of rugby that some of those Argentinians are capable of, it's, you know, that's right on our doorstep there. And, and that's going to be great because I'm sure they're going to want to beat us at some stage and they're going to be the, want to be the ones at the next World Cup. And we've got to stay ahead of them to, to be there. And then, you know, Chile's on the side thinking, well, our men are kind of leading the way. Why don't our women sort of rise to that level as well? So um, all that interconnectedness between the countries, they're, they're going to clamour against each other to get to that next level. Whereas, you know, a lot of other countries are, are quite oscillated and don't have those neighbouring countries that they can compete against all the time. Yeah, and I think you speak about that there. There's, it's just going to grow and grow, isn't it? And the fact that, you know, Brazil caused that upset and they've qualified. And like you say, Argentina won't take that lightly. They'll want to come back. And I think for Latin America, this is a bigger picture of, you know, where can this go? I've, I've read and speaking to Hugo, he's mentioned the fact that, you know, Brazil has got a, a massive population, 210 million other countries in Latin America are just like that. Like, where do you see it going? How big do you think it can get? I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I think the potential, yeah, just to spread because, you know, there's there's probably nine to ten countries along that route that could really all come through together if we encourage them and, and get them affiliated in the right way. So, um, you know, even having perhaps a World Cup qualifier in the future just from that area for men's and women's. So there might be six teams or something competing down there and that's exciting to be self-determining because, you know, that at the moment the men's sides have to go through USA, Canada and Jamaica, um, which is a big expense in, in travel and culture and everything. So the more we can grow, the more opportunities and the more bargaining power that they'll have at the table, et cetera. Um, I think the real opportunity is rugby league is a working man's game or working person's game. Um, and, and, and that's very attractive over there, you know, because football – is, is very much that in, in Latin America at the moment. And I feel the same way that I was brought up on rugby league. Like I lived in housing commission here and I'd play rugby league before school and at lunchtime and after school. And that's like soccer is over there because it's very accessible um, and everyone's welcome. So we want to create the same thing with rugby league and perhaps that hasn't always been a way with other sports over there and, and, and people are seeing that we're trying to involve everybody. So... I believe if, if we do it the right way and, and we just continue to give opportunities and equality to everyone, uh, that we can, people are going to recognise how exciting the game is and, and why you and I enjoy it so much. Yeah, definitely. I think you say accessible. And um, I, I think, you know, Australia's got a very different way of life that you do play sport a lot more because of the weather. And I think, you know, Brazil seemed a little bit like that. People wanted to be active. People loved the sport. People wanted to be fit, wanted to be doing that sort of stuff. And that just brought it back. I, I can't move past this topic of conversation because it leads in so nicely. So on the trip, um, three three of us went from, from England to come and join you with the Rugby League World Cup. And it was an amazing week. Got to learn so much more about the culture, hopefully spread some really positive messages about the sport and help you to, to increase the profile. But I'm, I'm just laughing there when you say making it accessible. The Brazilians will play rugby wherever. I'm going to let you tell the, the people watching this where we where we struck up a game of, of rugby whilst we were on the on the trip in Brazil and probably found a diamond in the rough as well. I hope she's playing. Oh yeah, you mean in the middle of this the supermarket? That was amazing. <laughs> in the middle of the decathlon. <laughs> so yeah, we um I guess for do you have decathlon in England? You don't do you? Or? I think there's a few dotted about, but not very many. I yeah, think I've seen one so, over in St Helens, I think. Okay, yeah. So for anyone who's not used to it, it's like a chain of sports stores, and it's reasonably big in in Brazil. And that one we went to, it wasn't like a small store yeah. in the middle of nowhere either. It was quite a substantial shop, and for them to just say, "Oh yeah, you can play rugby league in the aisles of the shop on the concrete and tiling," is <laughs> it's not what we're used to in in um, the Western world, you know, health and safety and all that sort of thing. But it was it was brilliant, and and people passing by who'd never tried it to stop and play, and uh, it was just a lot of smiles. And that 
it's it's all about making the best thing out of um, a situation. And there's actually a photo from Brazil a couple of years ago where they're playing in mud, like about knee deep. It's like it's sometimes you see these pitches in Papua New Guinea, but it's also there's one there where they're playing in in mud knee deep and four wheel drives are in the background trying to get through it. Um, but these guys are just playing on, so they really will take the opportunity. And, and what about when we went to the school for the um, the little tournament? We ended up playing on like that strip of of, of land up the top because we couldn't get a field big enough to fit all the kids on. So I, I, I tell you what, me and Dave, earned our, we earned our wages that day and, and the years of experience took us to that point. It were like we got there. <laughs> and um, I was so excited because obviously I love working with kids and I love introducing the sport because I'm, I'm as passionate as, as you, I guess, about it. And I think that that first, that first moment they get to experience could could change the path that they're on. They might decide they want to go play it and could be the next woman running out for Brazil Rugby League or, or man. And I was really excited. We were kind of knew that you might get half a bit of information with the language barrier and I was very glad that you were there because you and uh, Zach were there because I did not have a clue. Um, I've, I've learned hello and thank you, I think, at this point. And yeah, we got up, didn't we? We said we couldn't do it where we were meant to do it, so we had to walk. And I remember taking the picture of me and you. I was just like, we were like the Pied Pipers, just walking. Yeah. And then like <laughs> all these kids just following us. And I think we were prepared for about 30, 40 kids. And what were they, 80? 80 and a, and a seven-a-side football team. 80 and yeah, I was yeah. to myself, oh, I don't know what we can do here. <laughs> so we, we got a move and yeah. did, did some yeah. skills. And to be fair, the, the kids were so well-behaved. Um, and their ability to, to just get on with a task when asked to do so. But also, like, the, phys- the thing that I walked away thinking was the physical literacy was brilliant. So I, I don't mm. know what they're doing in PE, but it's really working because their physical literacy were really good. Um, and then we did all these skills, relays, everything that I could think of for 80 people to do within a seven-a-side football court. And then Dave came over to me and went... They want, they want to play a game. And I was like, what, 40 a side on a, a seven a side court? I think I'll have to leave that for next time. But they were just so they were just so excited and so just so happy to give anything a go. And hopefully we've 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 caused a few of them to really enjoy the sport and they're still playing with the balls that we left um left with the school. Hopefully they've got them out at free player time and, and stuff like that. But it it was just brilliant and I think it's that when there's an opportunity to create history, it becomes even more special. And I guess that's what you're, you guys are doing. And when it's something new and quite accessible, like was made in that decathlon store, I remember thinking some of the Brazil national players were there, weren't there? And that were great to have them there. And it's great that they're putting back into come and engage with us, but also to try and get more people involved on that journey. But I remember saying to one of the girls, like, who's who, who's that? Who's joined in with the bib on? Because we've bibbed them up and everything, haven't we? And then yeah. she went, oh, she just... She's one at cashier. She just works on the desk down there. She just said she'd come and give it a go. And I was like, no way. She was knocking people about. Like, she looked class. So hopefully she's playing now because I think that's that's like, that's what you want to do. Just get people who've got great physical literacy and good talent transfer and get them involved. But how, how has it been looking on the back of that visit? Have you had much feedback? Well, oh, it's funny what you're saying about you never know from those single instances who's going to grab on to and and one of the great things about when we were leading the kids through the street like the Pied Piper was the people at the shops that were stopping to look at us and like, what's this all about? And, um, you know, I know when I was a kid, Charlton Athletic came to Australia for like a promotional tour and, and I followed them for ages as a kid. And then actually speaking to Grant Ricks, who was on the bench in State of Origin, like like 1986, I think it was, he never got on the field, but he signed my um, card when I was like six years old. And I thought he was like a superhero, you know. And um, this is a guy that never got on the field for the biggest game of his life. And he just thought it was amazing. So all these little things people hold on to. So y- yourself and, and Dave and Rob coming from England, like I, I honestly think that those little kids are going to remember that. And even the, the girls and the guys that were at the senior tournament, it's going to stick with them forever. Uh, a funny little follow-up to what you're saying about the, the girl that we met in the shop was two weeks after you left to go back, I went to Maringa, which, um, as I say, it's the most isolated town where they play the closest out to the, the Amazon. Uh, and we did a two-hour course there, and it was bucketing rain the whole time. So we ended up on a basketball court. Um, and this girl came and joined us who was a, a basketballer, um, African-American, so fast, so skillful. She was the best 
by a mile. And I'm talking like we're at the stage where we're talking about her coming overseas to play with a club here. And I, I reckon she could fit into second, probably the second tier here straight away. And that's just someone who's never played the sport before but had all the athletic gifts that she could do it. So uh, it, it, it's hard because we haven't scratched the surface and that's both really encouraging but daunting at the same time because you don't want to miss someone who's a yeah. you know star in the making but the country is so large at the same time that it's it's a real challenge and especially with with covid now a lot of the things we would have gone to like say the state uh handball championships or the state netball or, or wrestling to see if there's people we could take from there a lot of that's been cancelled now so um you know it's a, it's a challenge for everybody around the world at the moment yeah, hundred percent, and I think talent transfer is going to be massive for you guys, isn't it? Because, like you say, it is so big, and the, the best thing about this competition for for all the nations involved, rugby league world cup, is it, it's going to be the best one yet. The rugby league world cup are doing an absolute fantastic job. John Dutton and his team are like the things that they've pulled off, like with Prince Harry at Buckingham Palace, and you know all the trips that they're doing around the world to increase that profile and increase everything involved with it is it's just been first class so i think it is gonna be tough but like you say you've got a massive opportunity with talent transfer the girls who played in the rio olympics for rugby sevens you know that will have had a big impact on increasing the profile hopefully of rugby and i know rugby union is a lot bigger um in brazil than rugby league but that's the same for some of the some of the other nations um that are competing but it's just such an opportunity and I think, you know, like you say, you made a great start, but that's just the, the, the drive within you and Hugo and the guys that are all involved to make sure that you don't miss anything because um, you, you've done such an amazing job to get to this point. So I don't, I don't think people realise just how big... Well, I didn't realise how big it was. I was absolutely gobsmacked. When we went to the national championships, how far the teams had travelled to actually oh, get yeah. there. So what, what did you say the furthest one away was? That was... Madagascar. So, yeah, they're about eight... Eight hours, um, so yeah, like 800, 900 kilometers away, um, and then none of the none of the teams in the women's were more were less than five hours away from each other. So. And they all just rocked up, ready. We did a, like a coaching masterclass, which again, glad that you you and Zach and, and Paul were there because I was I was like trying to coach, and so was Dave in English with as many sign languages as as I could come up with. Um, but great that you guys are there to translate. They were just all so keen, so ready. But when I watched the games, it you could tell there's some there's so much there to develop because the athleticism is there, the commitment, the, the bravery, the drive is all there. It's just the little technical tactical uh, tactical and technical stuff that will push them on to the next level and just a bit of time and that that will really really help so i'm going to speak to to um matt in the next part of it all about how that's going to go on but i think it'd be good to maybe finish on sort of a bit more about the the logo and things like that so the fact that you're trying to spread the world the word internationally so the the use of the rugby ball to get people seeing that that's what it's related to the word amazonas because it's great for people around the world to know what that means but i think that you're 100 percent right when you say that the women are, are strong they're brave and they're, they're doing something first they're creating history so i'll give you the final word if you want on 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 the amazonas or anything you want ahead of ahead of 2021 yeah i i guess that's one thing we have to do and probably the french have had to do is think about duality in what whatever you do because it has to convey well um in both languages and in all different cultures around the world so that's that's a challenge with some of what we do and um Particularly with the logo, we wanted to portray someone who was in the physical act of carrying a rugby league ball, um, looking aggressive, looking skillful at the same time. Um, so we can we can educate and sell to the public over there at the same time because we're not in a position like England where we could just put a lion inside a shield and say this represents our team because we don't have that cultural awareness of what the sport's all about. So um, I, I know from with Latin Heat, even though I feel our logo for that, it's quite attractive and it's worked well for us, we still get a lot of people come to us before events and see it on our shirts and say, do you guys play baseball or do you play basketball? And then we have to explain to them. So the, the purpose of the Amazonas logo is, is to start that conversation straight away and for them to, to know what the game entails. Um, the other interesting thing that came from when we launched the logo was 
we have a page with, uh, that's through Portal to Rugby, which is you met Victor Romalho, the, the journalist over there. He's got a list of, in Portuguese of all the differences between rugby league and rugby union and what are the rules of rugby league and, and basically an education for anyone who speaks Portuguese that can't access it in English elsewhere. And he said that there's 150-something new people went to view that as we launched the logo. So for me, that's like I, I don't really mind. <laughs> it's great that it gets attention around the rest of the world, but for if there's 150 new people in Brazil who know what the sport of rugby league's about, you know, it, it might sound like a small number at the moment, but I know that's going to grow exponentially over years to come. So um, that, that's a really pleasing aspect for me. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's just going to grow and grow. And, and like I said, the, the language is always tough because all the rules and things like that, like I've spoke about before, is all in English for use in England, Australia, New Zealand. So the fact that you've been able to translate and get someone else involved in doing that, it's just going to be a massive help, isn't it? And once you spread the word, it'll it'll just be a domino effect of someone will tell someone else and it'll go and it'll go. But I think it's going to be so exciting and I'm looking forward to speaking to Matt as well, seeing what he's thinking about the players. I'm sure his brain's in overdrive, um, yeah. thinking about steps moving forward. But he's got a task on his hand, but it's a, a really exciting one um, and one that's even more special for him with his nas- his heritage, but also creating history. So thanks for catching up with us, um, Rob. It's been brilliant to talk to you again. And like I say, a bit too early in the morning for me to have made a caipirinha to have on this call. <laughs> you could have maybe. Although I did, I did message Fester and say that um, I'd, I'd tried making a caipirinha because he'd bought us that bottle of uh, cachaça and yeah. I did not make it as well as Brazilian. So I'm going to have to <laughs> practice in lockdown. But yeah, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, awesome. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you next year um, in Leeds. Yep, yeah, definitely. First game of the tournament. So can't wait. No, perfect. Right. Well, thank you for catching up. And I'm going to get in touch with Matt now and, and start our conversations. Okay, sounds great. Cheers. Thanks, Lars. I'll see you in a bit. Right. So I've spoken to Rob Bergen all about the journey leading to the Olympics and getting to 2021, but the person who will be leading the team in 2021 is Matt Gardner. So, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? How are you keeping? Um, I'm good, thanks. Um, just sort of getting used to the whole, like, something like everybody else is in the whole world. Um, but yeah, other than that, fantastic, doing really well, thanks. Brilliant, brilliant. And and we're speaking about the World Cup in 2021 and a proud moment for you. you you've got the head coach's role of the Brazil women's national side. So I just thought I was thinking about how, how to speak about that. And I guess, how did it come about? What were the, what were the phone calls? What were your thought process and, and that sort of um, thing? Well, it came about at the end of 2018. I was there in Latin Heat in the Emerging Nations World Cup um, here in Sydney and I, ca- I was lucky enough to be captain in the team in the, in the World Cup. I, I had a pretty good tournament, I did pretty good. Um, I ended up in the World the World Cup year after that um, for that confederate um, group and then about a week straight after that competition I got a message uh, from Brazil from Hugo Proez, who's the uh, president over there in Brazil. He's, he's the one who got it all up and running uh, over there. He was like, how would you be interested in being the head coach for Brazil women? So I was like, <laughs> well, I didn't know where that had come from. I was really shocked by it because never, I've never coached at a high level or anything like that before. I've coached within uh, clubs I've been with uh, here, here mainly in Australia. And, you know, it's an opportunity you never, Say no to so to represent Brazil is one thing, and to coach them in a World Cup is just it's, it's like a dream come true. So, obviously, I said yes straight away, straight away. but yeah. yeah, I think it's that dual, that, that dual opportunity for you, isn't it? To, to represent Brazil, which is your mother's heritage and one that you're proud of, but then also do it in, in England. And I was just saying to Bob, like, this World Cup is going to be the best World Cup yet. Um, the Rugby League World Cup are doing an amazing job. and just I know where I'm biased and you're probably biased being being English, but the fact that it's going to be there, but the the stadiums that they're playing in, do you think that the girls realise how how big it's going to be? No, I mean when I when I heard the list of the stadiums that we're going to be playing, <laughs> I nearly dropped on the floor. I was like, oh my god, I can't believe we're going to coach Brazil in some of these stadiums. This is going to be ridiculous. Like the first game we're playing, we're playing England at Headingley as well, which is. You know, that's got a lot of uh, sentiment behind it for me as well. I used to play for Leeds when I first started out. 
and just just the the history of of that ground and then going there to to play with Brazil against England there is just going to be unbelievable. I don't think the girls quite understand understand yet. Uh, I think when me and Rob finally get to go over there, we're gonna we'll let them know what it's going to be like. <laughs> I think I think the most the most get a little bit of of how big it's going to be after the launch and and Margot went over um she went over to represent Brazil and met Prince Harry in Buckingham yeah. Palace and that sort of stuff I think must be must be getting the um the 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 chins wagging and sort of speaking about how how big it's going to be over there. Yeah, I mean that 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 for her would have been unbelievable. Like she could never have thought that was going to happen when she probably got asked to go and play for Brazil two years ago in, in the in the South American Championship. You know the, the journey that some of these girls are going to go on now from from that moment up until that World Cup is going to be unbelievable. And the experience they're going to get, is, you'll never ever get that again. You might never get that again. So it, I, I'm really excited for them more than anything. I've I've come through this through this background before and I've gone through some big tournaments and some big pull-ups for things and yeah, I know how exciting it's gonna be and there's no bad place to do it in England. Like you know, really it's, that's what we believe really doing it in England. Yeah, I'm excited for the girls. I know and, and I was saying to Rob as well, um it's it's sport, it gives you so many opportunities. I know like it I'd said to him it does seem cliche, but the fact of like you know her going over to to do all that but the same for you like you know you would have never you know t- you know you would have never ever thought starting out your career as a rugby player that you'd, you'd you'd do as well as you've done in in that area but then also move on to coaching and and be able to you know you would have never dreamt this up because you know one people would have never first thought in their head that brazil would have a women's rugby league team but thanks to like to hugo and rob and uh gilberto and, and people like that like that that's just their dream that is kind of and passion that is is put it on that project that projectile and it's happening and the same for me like I would have never ever thought that I'd have been able to go to Brazil just to talk about rugby league like I love rugby league I would talk yeah. about it anywhere but yeah. to go and speak about it in Brazil like I was I was pinching myself so yeah. I think th- you understand that and I know you said that c- coaching wise you've not you've not coached at high level you've coached you know teams in Australia and stuff like that but your background as a player um, and all the things that you've learned along that journey will surely just put you in great stead to be able to do that. What do you think? I've, yeah, I mean, like to, uh, my transition from player into coach was, I was kind of like thrusted into it. Uh, I come over to Australia and uh, I signed for a, a really small little club uh, out there in South, uh, South Queensland, right out in the bush. And that was my opportunity to get, to come over here. And then I got there and it was completely, foreign to me like being out there with nothing around you or anything like that but the group of like there were, were unbelievable like they were just really raw just just wanted to play rugby league all the time um, and a lot of them hadn't been coached which amazed me because I thought I was going to go over there and just be in front of these guys who had just been coached like, by some unbelievable coaches and learned some amazing things I was going to learn from them and uh, we get three games into the season and we lost all three games. Close, lost all three games. And I get a call from the the president of the club. He's like, "Right, we're we're gonna we're gonna get rid of the head coach. The head coach." I was like, "What?" <laughs> I was like, "You know, I wasn't ready for that and that type of you know commitment to that club. Like, I was ready there to commit as a, um, but as you know, I knew I knew they needed help from. Somewhere. So I, obviously, I I said yes to helping them, but." Said, don't get rid of that coach because he's been a coach longer than me and I don't really know what I'm doing like on that side of things so I can learn from him he can learn from me like the things that I've got and you know in front of the lads for the first time and I, and I was talking to them and I was teaching them things that they've never been, never been taught before this is absolutely brilliant I loved it and uh, you know we went on to have a really good season and it was off, off the back of the things that I implemented there at that club and uh, you know it was it was a really good time at that, at that club and then obviously going forward um, I've always been on the coach side of things I've been a personal trainer for 11 years as well so coaching people one-on-one through fitness and health um, and I just sat back like when I was coming towards the end of my career and I thought especially when I got off with the job as well I was just like you know this this is something I really want to do it, it, it excites me more than except it excites me a little bit more than playing <laughs> because you get to impart some knowledge to some young guys some younger players coming through. It, it's it's a total different challenge as well, isn't it? And I think 
I'll be honest, I don't think that any coach ever gets any job where they just it sits with them so comfortably that they're just like, yeah, that's fine. I think you've always got to be kind of on your toes of this is a big challenge, but one, it excites me, like you've said, and two, I'm in it for the right reasons. I want to do the right thing. So I think I think you'll do brilliant, and it'll be it'll be brilliant to see that journey that that you're on and stuff like that. And and like you say, it's just that opportunity as well of, of representing Brazil. I know we've just spoke briefly about the journey you were on in in 2016 to represent uh, Brazil at the Olympics and and got that injury. So and that might happen for some of the players that you work with as well. So you know how do you think that that obviously at the time it seemed like the the worst thing that could ever happen, but as that going to help you on that coach's journey because you kind of have been there you've got that opportunity and experience to 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 look back on for any players that maybe go through that or something similar on that on that journey for you as a as a coach that that whole time there from going from playing rugby league to playing for brazil um i left i left rugby league in uh for the at the time and i uh, had a pretty big hip operation and they put me out for the whole year and then halfway through that season, I got an email asking me if I wanted to play for Brazil 7. I was like, well, I didn't even know the rugby team to begin with. And then obviously straight away I was like, yep. Yeah. And then within weeks, I was playing to, to South Africa um, to play for him. And then that whole journey was just unbelievable. Like being a part of that, playing on the HSBC World 7 circuit around the world was unbelievable. And then the big the big carrot dangling at the end of it was playing that Olympics. And... I got, I got so close. I got to the, the, the 2015 season. We played in that Pan American Games in Toronto and uh, just got really unlucky in a tackle and um, ruptured my hamstring completely off the bone. And um, we, were, you know, we, were, we were thinking, oh, we're going get, to get back from this injury in time for the Olympics. And it just, it just was never going to happen. It was too much of a big injury to come back from in the short time. I was still the game as well. I'd only been a part of the set for like about a year and a half learning how to play the sevens properly and you know we both come to the decision that it was going to work. I didn't want to uh, take away a position from somebody somebody else who could who could play in that in that Olympics. So yeah that was probably the worst thing that I'd, I could say could happen in my happened in my career. I'd missed out on that Olympics. Um, but as well it was the best things that happened as well because it just Gave me a new mentality of going forward and getting through that injury and then pushing on into something and to other better things through. Yeah, but that I can't even begin to imagine how tough it was at the time because, and I think like I was just thinking then, it's there's nowhere to hide in sevens. I've never played sevens, but I've watched it and there was nowhere <laughs> to hide. You're not going in at eighty percent fitness for a sevens game, are you? No. <laughs> When I started playing for him, I was like, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll be good at this." You know, I'm, you know, I play, I play center. I was playing center at the at the time uh, for Lee, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll be good at this." But as soon as I got on that pitch, I, just, I did not realize how quick it was going to be. It was really tough, and we we went out to Las Vegas. That was the first tournament I played in, and first game Australia <laughs> under the lights in uh, Vegas. Well, that. Baptism of fire, <laughs> it's like that. It was very fast, very tough, um, very, very technical. And I didn't really know the technicalities of scrumming and rooking and all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, I got found out a few times. It was pretty tough. <laughs> I know, but again, again, like you say, who, could, who, how many players can look back and say that they've played in Las Vegas, Toronto and all, all those places that you, you've just read? So I know it would have been the, the cherry on the top of the cake to be at those Olympics in Rio and yeah. and that's what you'd been aiming for. But I think it's true what you say, that sometimes the, the worst things that could happen to you and the toughest things, uh, the biggest learning curves and they do probably give you a bit of a different men- mentality. I know that I've, I've kind of, seeing that over the last year or so with having to retire it's you don't really think there's anything to take from it but you definitely will and I hope that in a way that's going to help me with my coaching moving forwards because you've kind of got that experience of you've not just had a, a glittering sort of everything's gone your way you've kind of had to respond to to things that you didn't want to and hopefully that will help you with with players as you go but um we'll, we'll have to see and see if the proof is in the pudding when we both get going yeah. after COVID, absolutely, but... yeah. absolutely. <laughs> How are how are plans looking for sort of twenty twenty one then and, and and leading into the into the tournament? Are you have you got much firm plans in place at the moment? Or fantastic until 
the travel bans and everything around the world uh, happen. Uh, being in Brazil, like on the first on the first training camp. Um, so obviously that that's that that side of things have have not gone straight to plan. But any plans that we have got for the future going forward are all definitely still going to go ahead. You know, me and Rob have been talking about possible um, friendly things that we need to to get in place for the World Cup, and you know, there's a couple of games there like against Chile, Argentina. Um, you know, possibility of getting somebody on the way over to England as well, uh, like maybe USA or South Africa. These these countries have been, you know, throwing the, throwing the hat in the ring to have a have a great have a game of us. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of things going on, and all all the camps that we've got planned as well. You know, we're, we're trying to get over there to Brazil as we possibly can, um, and you know, be around the girls as much as we possibly can. A lot of the girls uh, come from a rugby union background, and a lot of them started playing off in rugby league. And uh, I know from my from being over there in rugby union, it is very rugby union. Like they're, they're like being in England and being around rugby union players, that that feeling of that camp, it's completely different to being in a rugby league. And uh, you know, we're we're eager to get over there and start doing that. And then rugby league. Uh, feelings like that you get when you're, when you're around the league clubs into those girls so they um, can start understanding what it's really like to be a rugby league player no i i'd agree so the gate the games that i i saw um at the national uh championships in december the girls were brilliant at just getting the ball and, and going they were they were tough they were physical they were strong um it was just that game awareness of um, like the kick on the third tackle, and I'm on the sideline pulling my hair out, thinking, "Just keep going." <laughs> um, but at the same time, some brilliant course girl. I remember there were one where they, they scored down the left wing, and it would kind of just shift the ball, and it were the timing of the pass brilliant, and yeah. it were really good. Um, so I'm sure that that gives you a lot of a lot of confidence. And I was reading that um, in the the game that they qualified against Argentina. Um, Andrew Charles, your assistant, he was he was there watching that game, and and he's he's obviously been taking notes as well. So you know, how did that come about? Him being involved, you know, he's caught, he's been an assistant for the Gillaru, so he's got experience of of um, the women's game. How did that come about? Appointing him as your assistant? Uh, Andrew was the head coach for the Heat when I he'd been the head coach for the Latin Heat for uh, a good few years, I think, and uh, he was the head coach for the. Emerging Nations World Cup, and I'd only, I'd only had one involvement with him prior to that, and I represented uh, Queensland. That was my first ever game in Australia for against New South Wales, and it was a Latino state of origin, so it was like a, a trial trial match to uh, get into the club for the uh, Latin Heat for the World Cup. And uh, you know there was he, he had a I knew he had a good reputation. Like I spoke to quite a few of the boys. Um, didn't really get much chance to speak to him um, in the through the Latino origin, and then yeah, he he got me up and asked me a captaincy for that, and that was the first time I spoke to him. And then got on real like you know we had, we had a really good little partnership there when we were going through our our build up for the for the World Cup. Um, uh, he he helped me out with stuff, and I helped him out with stuff like with ideas and things that we could do with the team and training. And you know, it was just it was a good little good little partnership, and uh, I think from that, that's that's where that came from going uh, from Hugo. He, he thought that you know, that would be a pretty good, really good partnership going for carrying forward. Plus, with Andrew's um, previous history with uh, development teams like Thailand, um, he's involved with Germany as well. No, that it sounds brilliant, and and it'll be good. It'll be good having someone who's been involved in 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 developing other nations but also in the women's game as well so that that looks brilliant and I guess my next question is we spoke about the transfer from player to coach we spoke about kind of your heritage and pride in representing Brazil but also in England on a on a on a home world cup I, w- I was going to ask are you prepared for coaching women like <laughs> we are very different <laughs> um I spoke to like people like Andrew and uh uh, another guy who uh, who was in our coaching stuff, he was he was coaching uh, the Jewelries as well. I think he was the first first coach of the Jewelries back, back 
a few years ago and he said to me do you understand that this is going to be very very similar to coaching men and i was like really and he was like yes all the emotions <laughs> everything you know it's, you've got to be you got to be on the money all the time because you, you're going to get thrown a lot of things uh, with these <laughs> No, no. I think I think you might need to give um you might need to give Cuff Boring um he put up with us for two years and yeah. then obviously <laughs> listen to the podcast with uh, Scully um yeah. I think the only thing that Scully mentioned is that we like to ask a lot of questions so we're yeah. very very chatty but it was just it was just by chance that I was watching um a video came up while we we're in lockdown and I was interviewing Adam uh Cuffertson yeah. at one point and then he just started giggling out of nowhere and I said what like what? I didn't see it I like what's up with you and um. Shabu, who I've also interviewed on one of these podcasts, had um, basically like mooned him. So I'm <laughs> having a really serious conversation, chatting to Cuffo, and he's staring at Charlotte Boom's backside. And, you know, and I, I think he, he, that was the moment you can just see in his face. He's just like, "What? What have I? What have I done here? Like, yeah. why am? Why am I here?" And there's there's a few stories I won't go into them, but yeah, you're definitely worth catching up with the likes of Scully or yeah. or Cuffo about. Well, that makes me really happy that the girls are just as silly as the boys when it comes to everything else. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just as silly, if not sillier. Yeah. But it's also like, yeah, we, we're very different. Like, I think we're quite literal as well. Like, lad, lads, well, lads are quite literal, actually. Lads, you could say to a lad, run to the cone, run round it and come back. Yeah. But if you say to a girl, run round it, we want to know what colour the cone is. And yeah. is it the first one or second one? Like, we, we do like a question. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I said I've been a PT yeah. for 11 years and the, the majority of my clients are uh, female. And if you ask me, I'd say a hundred million times that I would prefer coaching a woman than a man. Because they listen. They listen to everything that you say and they do it. If you say to them, like, this is what you to do something, they, they just do it. And they just, women are just so much easier to, to, get, uh, to talk to and, they, you know, they listen. That's exactly so. That that is very true. I say to the lads at work, so we're like development officers, and so, and I I predominantly work with just girls in school, and sometimes I have to ask the lads if they can help out and cover some of the sessions, and they they come out and they say like that is a breath of fresh air because girls are like receptive, like sponges. You can tell them something, especially with rugby being a little bit new, yeah. um, or newer for them. They'll be like. The, they'll listen to everything and they'll want to know more and they'll do as they've asked but a lad will be like he'll have already known that he'll have done it 12 times you can't <laughs> teach me anything <laughs> so that, that's the difference absolutely no so I think that's, that's a nice thing isn't it yeah that, that's the good thing for you is that the girls are going to be so receptive and they, they're going to have so much to not so much to learn but they're going to be willing to learn so much Um, so that must be exciting they'll be like no egos and like you know people a brand new sport they just want to learn they just want to do good and i know they'll just they'll just soak up everything that that gets thrown at them uh which which is what excites me a lot and you've got that additional spark of you've got an opportunity to create history that's it like it's i played for the men's team like i came out and i was coaching the uh the men's uh brazilian australian squad uh here in australia at the beginning of the year we played against um Korea. And same thing, boys had uh, come from a uh, rugby union background, so they didn't really know much about the rugby league. I got them in there, we were training every week for about nine weeks leading up to the game, and they just absolutely loved it. They just talked up every single thing that I said, knowledge I'd give to them, or anything that we were talking about. And then, you know, when it, it, it was, it was just brilliant. There was no egos around, like, it was just like back to simple, basic stuff. And it was just a fantastic experience for that. Um, and just whet the appetite to, to go there and, and work with the girls. No, it's 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 so exciting and it's been great. It's been great speaking to you and you can tell how passionate you are and how excited you are to get going. So um I'm looking forward to, to seeing you in 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 Leeds at Head and Lift and yeah. that opening opening round. I'm sure I'll yeah, be back. Um, yeah. both catch up with, with you all before that anyways, with Hugo and, and uh, Rob coming over and stuff like that. So yeah. um it's been great to catch up and it's yeah. it's so exciting the journey that you're all on um so thank you so much for taking time out to, uh, no, to thank catch you up. very much um no it's, it's good so i'll i'll see you in november 2021 you will absolutely <laughs> <laughs> well all the all the best in the meantime um and it's been brilliant catching up cheers lois thank you <laughs> cheers back <laughs>